Welcome to Base Space. A crypto podcast. Base Space. Hey everyone, I see we have some new listeners as well. Uh, welcome to the Base Space, the crypto podcast hosted by myself, the crypto Mewtwo. Chase Coins and Super High that creates opportunities for growth, networking, and education in the crypto industry. Today, we have the honor of having Jacob Steves, co founder and engineer, and Caro, front end lead slash engineer from the Open Tether Foundation for building the BitTensor network. Welcome to the show, guys. Just pumped to have you on. Super. Thanks for having us. It's great to be here. Right on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Uh, Super is a huge fan of the project and I'm excited to, to learn more. But before we do that, we always like to ask our new guests, like how they got into crypto. We'd love to hear, hear your guys' story. Maybe we start off with Jacob and then move to Carl. So, so question is how, how I got into crypto. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so I was, um, I was working for a subcontracting company of DARPA building neuromorphic chips uh, when I graduated from university. It was the first job I, I found. Um, that was doing something that I thought was going to innovate machine intelligence because I was at, studying at university and, and really thought that the biggest issues um, in, in machine intelligence were com around compute. Um, so this company was building normal for chips, uh, which are basically like brains, but on a computer, um, you know, doing computation physically or, or with analog computing. Really, really interesting idea. And, and the, the founder of this company, I uh, cold called you know, they talk about that. How do, you, how do you get a job at a university? You just call the CEO, right? And say, hey, give me a job. So I called I called him up and I said, hey, um, I'm a fresh out of university. I want a job. Give me a job. And, and he's like, cool. Um, and so I ended up working with this guy. He was a super G, like uh, genius. He had invented something called the DARPA Synapse Program, which was funded um, to the tune of a billion dollars and gave out contracts to IBM, um, to Intel, to build the brain chip for the military. And uh, he saw what these companies had done. They'd done a really bad job with that billion dollars. Uh, IBM built a chip called True North, which at the time was the most complex chip in the world. It had a trillion transistors, which was the, the most ever, um, and, but couldn't do MNIST, which MNIST is like the hella world of machine. Um, and the reason they, they, uh, they failed was because they basically took a bunch of neuroscientists and threw them on the AI problem. But neuroscientists know how to emulate neurons, but they don't know how to see the force through the trees um, and actually build the computational substrates that are required to do machine intelligence so uh he left and started a company called Noma. i wouldn't work for him and, and uh, he paid me in bitcoin in 2015 um at 200 dollars per per bitcoin that was a great time um and uh taught me the ways and i got really stoked on on bitcoin back in, in around that time and i started uh, teaching it in vancouver um at this underground community space called uh, decentral uh which was like a real grungy anarchist um, basement dwellers crypto space with like red lights and a, and a stairwell that goes down into the uh, underground and a bunch of weird cats you know talking about crypto and and memes and doge and all those things and kind of losing their minds um and so i started talking a lot about crypto there and learning about the the world and became a bit of a maximalist i would like to say i'm a maximalist although um it's a little hard when you're creating your own cryptocurrency so um uh, yeah, that's how I got in. Uh, and then I, 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 I was, you know, I took my machine learning engineering background and, and really was fascinated by, by Bitcoin's ability to consume uh, the largest amount of computational, computational power in the world, um, you know, magnitudes larger than companies like Google. Um, and I wanted to, to apply that same, you know, unifying force to the AI world. And that's, that's my, my, uh, my history there, my beginning in crypto. Very base. Love to hear that. And what about you, Caro? Incredibly based. Uh, even I, I just learned about this. Is I, I didn't. Even, it's incredible that I didn't know you worked on neuromorphic chips, particularly True North. That's incredible. No, no, no. I, I never worked on True North. No, no. I worked with a guy who ran the program that funded IBM. Um, so IBM did True North, and as I was saying, disaster. So don't count <laughs> on there. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Hey, hey, nonetheless, we we all learn something new every day, right? Yeah. Um, but. <laughs> Wait, the question was how we got started, right, in crypto? Yes, sir. Yeah, so um, when I was in the sixth grade, I had a particular problem, which was uh, how do I buy a computer? 
And uh, what I would do when I was a kid uh, is I would go and work on these construction sites and I'd pick up trash for about f- for $5 a day. And so by the end of the summer, I had accumulated enough money to buy this like the low end Toshiba computer. And so I'd run into a problem, which was that the computer that I wanted to get was on eBay and you needed a credit card or a debit card in order to, to uh, uh, you know, be able to purchase this computer. And so what I would end up was I would go to Walmart and get those prepaid gift cards. And there was just a whole hassle in order to, to, to buy things on the internet for me. And so one day I was watching like a rerun of The Good Wife. And uh, it was about like the founder of Satoshi Nakamoto was getting doxxed and like he was in court and all this and the, the good wife was the lawyer for it. Anyways, the whole, the whole episode was pretty intriguing to me. And so I was like, oh, I wanna go get, I wanna, I wanna get involved in Bitcoin. And so I took that Toshiba laptop and really started from there. Um, I started building, you know, different things or trying to at least, right? Like different applications that would like be like essentially wallets for Bitcoin. Um, and then uh, I, after that, um, I got involved uh, with some, some League of Legends, uh, like video game add-ons essentially. Um, and I accepted Ethereum for that. And so uh, I, you know, it was, it, it's really cool. The, the, the thing I liked about crypto so much uh, when I got started was that like, if you wanted to get a bank account, you had to do so much KYC. But with crypto, you just have to create a wallet on your computer and you can create as many wallets as you want. And, you know, basically, like, you can keep your money there. And so this was really interesting to me, uh, particularly when I wasn't able to get a bank account. So uh, that's that's how I got started with crypto. Oh, Jacob, I saw you unmuted. I didn't know if you had anything to add there. I just just makes sense that Carol was trying to get around regulations. Um, uh, and that's why he's in crypto. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know me. <laughs> uh, you know, that's having worked with Carol for a while, that's I I, I know the man uh, is hard to contain in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we won't dive too deep into that one. Um, <laughs> Jacob, I'm like also very curious. Like, how did you, how did you even like decide to like start building? tensor like what what kind of got you like moving group and this project to to building it out to where it is today sure so i was um i was i was working at this normal chip company and they they were failing um because there was really no market for their chip um you know google was building the tpus and and i was so upset because they had this really great um software and hardware that would have made their economies of scale, um, sorry, not their economies of scale, but their, the efficiency of their chips, you know, much better than, than anything that, uh, G, that uh, Google was doing. But they couldn't plug that into anything, right? There was no direct market for them. And uh, I explained this to them, my, my boss at the time, the genius guy, um, and he didn't really see the light. Um, he, he kind of believed that they would be able to find that market, but it never happened, I don't think. Um, And so I set up to kind of build a, to build a market for this commodity that we were mining, you know, we're, we're creating machine intelligence. And we, at the time we were doing unsupervised learning, Um, you know, it's something that's transferable. Um, It's really hard to mine from data uh, and it's generally valuable. So it kind of has like the, the trilogy of, of a currency, right? It's like fungible, it's universally acceptable, it's, it's expensive, it holds value, all these things. So it's, it's a little bit like a, a currency. And I was, and I was fascinated by, by cryptocurrencies at the time. And I thought, well, hey, we could build a, a currency which has its, you know, basis in, in machine intelligence. Um, but uh, I was at that time, I just graduated from university, I was kind of an idiot and didn't really know what I was doing. So I started, I started coding this, I started uh, taking TensorFlow and breaking it apart and building um, like sockets into the TensorFlow operations. So you could like write a graph um, that was a, a whole bunch of um, RPC connections to a bunch of other graphs and, and build these networks, um, but didn't really know what I was doing um, and ended up kind of failing uh, and going to Google and ended up at Google where I worked with the sort of enterprise machine learning that they were doing, which is pretty, you know, hardcore to, to say the least. And, um, you know, on the weekends was writing a lot of BitTensor, um, the idea was just to kind of connect machine intelligence into the internet because that was a dimension that hasn't really been touched into. Everything is server-based, like single server, um, high fidelity connections, low bandwidth, Um, a little bit like what computing was in the 1960s and 70s where 
companies have these massive mainframe computers in-house that cost tens of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands of dollars um, at the time. And, and only experts can, can really interact with them. Um, and personal computing, the invention of the internet, uh, allowed us all to you know, plug into this global network of sharing ideas, um, you know, concepts, you know, content, build markets. And, and so I felt that that was the direction that we needed to take artificial intelligence. Um, it, was, it was actually kind of a really funny story. I was, I was building neuromorphic chips at my cousin's house and we were watching um, Halt and Catch Fire. I don't know if you guys have seen that show, Halt and Catch Fire. Um, but in the first, uh, in the first scene of Hulk Catch Fire, it's about the invention of the, the laptop. Um, the first scene is the main character walking into this, this, uh, I believe it's, uh, Carnegie Mellon or, or Berkeley or, or Stanford computer science class. And he's like, Hey, you know, what's the invention that's going to, you know, uh, revolutionize computing in the next 10 years. And, and somebody's like a normal for chip. They basically describe a normal for chip and he's like, sit on, you know, and then another main character, uh, in the back goes, you know, um, it, we're going to determine, we're going to, we're going to invent a protocol for connecting all of these computers together. Um, and then that's the beginning of the show. Um, and I watched that show and I remember thinking that, so right, the, the, over the last 50 years in computing, the real, real innovations, the things that have affected our lives the most have been you know, about increasing connectivity, uh, increasing collaboration between humans, um, putting the lines between the nodes. Uh, so that was that was the inspiration. Um, and I was also inspired by Bitcoin. So I started working at that on the weekends. And then I eventually quit Google um, for ethical reasons and also just to pursue my my passion for building the neural Internet. That was around 2018. Very cool. That's a very cool story. Um, I, I think this is a good kind of segue to, to start diving into uh, bit center and discussing the protocol at a, at a high level. So just kind of pivoting from, you know, what made you decide to build this out for those who may not be familiar with what bit uh, tensor is, could you explain it at a high level uh, what the protocol aims to do? Sure. I think the, the direction that people understand the, the most is that we're, we're a Bitcoin mining network. Um, it's a peer to peer system where the computers are expending computational energy and power to produce something which is valuable, uh, but instead of hashes, we're we're mining this this intelligent element, the 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 intelligence element, and uh, and then there's validation of that element to, um, based on a set of validators. So um, this creates by build by focusing on the market, um, we can create a sort of network of computers which are all working together um, in producing this this neural element. Um, and, and that's essentially where we are. That's what it looks like, right? We, we define this way of validating the thing that we want. And then we let the, you know, the hive mind, you know, come in and fill the gaps and solve, um, the AI problem that we want them to solve. Um, you know, at this moment in time, they kind of dive into some of the details working on textual understanding. So we want the computers to be able to understand text, to be able to generate it, to be able to produce representations of it, to summarize it, et cetera. Um, and that's this general general problem that is valuable to a lot of different, you know, down, downstream tasks. And we, we've, you know, Carol can speak to this. You know, we've we've begun to build um, a number of products. Well, one specific product we call um, the Playground, which is a product built on top of the the commodity that these miners are are producing. So um, maybe Al, um, sorry, Alec Carol can speak to that. Um, what what the Playground is? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the the Playground uh, is essentially a way for us to interface um, in human natural language with the uh, AIs that are in the network. And so one of the really cool things that, that you're able to do is be able to query different UIDs and get the best response out. And so uh, utilizing technology like this um, allows us to, uh, while, while technically uh, the AIs are, are speaking to each other through the axon, um, with something like the playground, it allows us to build something on top of communication so that humans can also interface with it. And so these human to computer interfaces are, are something that we are actively um, investigating and building at, at the Open Tensor Foundation. Um, there's a lot of exciting stuff that I can't really speak about right now, uh, but I'm, I'm super eager to share with uh, the, the community and, and to the world at large. Hmm. Gotta, keep the, gotta keep the secret sauce, secret. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Listen, hey, hey, you know, it's like uh, the iPhone 4S 
someone left it at a bar in San Francisco and Apple was like, this thing is literally priceless. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's no, but that's we, the mentality. <laughs> but what we have today, what we have today is a market for machine intelligence. It's a, a new way of measuring the development of AI that's you know, evolving it away from this academic competition, which is, you know, run by conferences and, and uh, paper writing or moving it to this high, fast, uh, sorry, the fast moving market where validators are with high resolution determining what the miners are producing and rewarding them, you know, in, in information for, for the work that they've done. Um, I had a question real quick. Uh, so you guys mentioned in the beginning, like, this AI is, is solving like different problems, correct? I, that's well, right now, <clears throat> right now we're solving one problem, but it just so happens that that problem is a foundational problem to a lot of others. Uh, that's the very interesting idea of, of unsupervised learning. You, you, you train your machine learning models to solve a problem, which is not the direct one that you're attempting because there's more data. So you can say, take a terabyte corpus of text. Uh, and compress that into your machine learning model to give it a, a prior understanding of language uh, from which you can branch off uh, to solve any problem in language. Um, for instance, if you wanted to do sentiment analysis, um, there's only so many labeled data sets for sentiment analysis. And so instead, um, if you wanted to do sentiment analysis, you would start from a language model which has been pre-trained on a large corpus of unlabeled text using a large language model. Um, and that language model has learned how to um, represent that, pull out the latent space um, uh, specifically, uh, compress it into a representation, so the sentences into a representation where it's easy to solve the, the higher level task of, um, of sentiment analysis. So we focus on those problems because it produces a general basis for anything else and something that there's a large number of people to be interested in. Um, most of the prod of the products that you could build on top of language models would start with uh, unsupervised knowledge. So let's, let's invent one on the spot. Say I really wanted to, uh, you know, have an app that takes all of your writing and makes the your language sound like Orwell, right? You know, short sentences with no um, uh, spurious words. You could you would first begin with a language model which has been trained on text so that it understands meaning. And then you would take a whole bunch of Orwell's text and fine tune it to sound like that thing. So we could you could build an application on top of the knowledge um, in BitTensor very easily because it's it's general. Um, and you know there's a lot of projects that are coming about um, coming up right now in the AI space that are doing specific things like that. Um, you know the idea for the one I just described comes from an application that I use is called Hemingway, which makes your your writing sound more like Hemingway. And the all of those problems. Um, depend the base commodity of machine intelligence, which is general. Um, so that's where we're trying to situate ourselves is this kind of neural internet um, that a pool or an ocean, which, which all of these applications can dip into to solve their specific problems um, using the, the large network of collaborative machine intelligence that we're producing. Uh, yeah, that's Jacob. Good. that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Jacob, that really kind of touches on, on, on my follow up question on that. Uh, you know, when people kind of ask, you know, they, they think AI, they think, you know, blockchain and the combining of the two, uh, ultimately, like, why is BitTensor needed? What, like, what is the problem that you guys are ultimately solving? Or what is like the ultimate service that's really being offered here when you combine blockchain technology with the AI? Well, I think, I think, you know, I, I mentioned before that there's this value that is accrued by a machine learning model, you know, in its weights. And that's a representation. It's, an, it's the way that it looks at the world. And, you know, traditionally, or say like contemporarily, the machine learning world is, is very disconnected. And there are many machine learning models, but they're not talking to each other, they're not learning from each other. And we want to break down that door to connect the machine learning models together. We want to connect the engineers together. Um, and we want to start working on this collective intelligence, like, you know, the level of humanity rather than the level of the individual, um, you know, for efficiency reasons, I think, number one. But it's more than that, right? Because we're also nesting this pursuit of machine learning, you know, or our AGI underneath the market. And that, that's going to also stimulate you know, efficiencies um, and innovation as people you know, are driven by self-interest to, to solve you know, micro problems in this network. We think that that will you know, hyper drive the pursuit of AGI.
I think I think that's you know the the thing that we're bringing to the table here is is a hyper efficient way of creating, sharing, storing um, machine intelligence and making it accessible and open to people. Uh, that doesn't exist. There are you know systems like Hugging Face where people are posting models, but they're not running inference on them right for you, and and they're also not being paid. And the whole market is essentially existing because of, you know, this demand for altruism in the AI space. But what happens, you know, in fact, is that uh, is that these companies that are trying to be altruistic and are really, you know, funded by large organizations like Google. Right. I won't name any names, but the majority of them are actually funded to billions of dollars to open source the the products of their their adversaries. You know, rather than actually figuring out a way of incentivizing the machine learning engineers to do the work and make it open, um, they're 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 paying them to to break down uh, the monopolies of their competitors. So so we, we think this creates a much more you know fair, um, equitable way of paying out. Uh, you know, allowing people to, to have a stake in the, this development of artificial intelligence of you know quote unquote AGI. That's another angle here. Yeah, I uh, I response and I love the idea. And I was going to ask some of these questions later in the interview. Um, but while we're kind of touching at the 10,000 foot level and, and the more philosophical approach on this, why, why is it important for AI to be a public good in, in your guys' view? Well, we want it to be, if it is going to be this technology that you know drives us into the future and is potentially dangerous, we need to make this technology symbiotic with humanity. Um, we need to make it, you know, if it's going to be a corporation, it needs to be a corporation which we all own, which we can all use, um, which we all are building together. And uh, that's the way that we can ensure that it is actually working for us. It's that, that symbiosis. And, you know, if it's a small group of people that control the whole thing, uh, that, that will not work very well because those small group of people will use it for themselves. Um, you know, right now there's this battle in the AI space around, you know, hate speech and, uh, you know, how, sh how can we start censoring people on the internet? Um, you know, on the face of it, it sounds like a really great idea, right? Let's make the internet a safer space so there's no hate speech and people are nicer to each other. Great. But, but who decides uh, who, like, who gets to make the decision of what's, what's right and what's wrong? And and I think that that if that's not democratic, if people can't have an uh, you know an avenue to to some control over that decision, if it's just maintained by these large centralized organizations, it will be used to benefit them and not not us. So we need to build open systems where people can have a stake in it. Uh, they can they can get revenue from it. They can they can work their ass off into it. Uh, you know, it doesn't mean that that's all. You know, uh, and a lot of people in this talk are probably mind bit tensor, and so they know it's it's not exactly all all easy. And, and there's there's there are. Uh, um, you know, barriers to entry in terms of the technological, you know, know-how that you need to to get yourself into the system. But the avenue is there; the door is open for people to really run these these networks. Um, I I I think that AGI is going to be um, one of the most powerful technologies in the next fifty to hundred years. And I don't think that the real problem is you know roboting down the streets and and tr taking over and reaching sentience. Um, I think that the the real issue here is about centralization of power, um, you know, a single corporation or a, a number of corporations that control this technology and use it to benefit themselves. And that's kind of what they're doing um, at these large companies like Google and, and OpenAI. They're, they're, oh, we're ethical. We're going to try to stop the AGI from taking over. And, um, and so you can trust us to, to censor uh, and to hold this technology uh, closed instead of open. And I think that that's the, the sci-fi uh, answer, but it's not the the actual problem that's facing humanity right now. Yeah, that's it, it, you know it is a, a fascinating uh, industry, and, and I do agree. I think it's one of the technological innovations of, of this century. And I'm curious, like you know, in the future with, with uh, AGI, who are ultimately the end users, and how does that uh, factor in you know token appreciation of services are paid out in certain tokens, like I guess kind of what I'm getting at is, yeah. could you foresee a, a day where maybe the average person that wants access to AGI could be priced out in a, in a way? I I think it's it's it is likely that the the mining side of of BitTensor um, will be quite costly. Um, it already is, you know, it, it already takes a VPS at least, and it takes a long time to register into the network, um, and that's because the models that we want are pretty large. 
uh, they have you know billions of parameters and, and to do inference at the speed that makes this system you know worthwhile to the uh, you need a GPU or two GPUs or maybe three GPUs to run that endpoint. And, and we're, we're starting to talk about, you know, a couple thousand dollars a month to, to run that endpoint. So this isn't just, you know, anybody. Um, the, the thing that, uh, that makes it open is the fact that there's, there's cooperation and there's also competition between the validators and the entry points. So, not everybody, not only one person has the only entry point into the system. And so that's where there's competition, um, where something like, for instance, Twitter doesn't have. Twitter, there's one entry point into the decentralized protocol that it could be, um, you know, of, of, of sharing tweets. Uh, there's only one company. Whereas what we want to create is a system where there are, you know, thousands and thousands of people that have access to, or, you know, thousands and thousands of companies that have access to this this system can mine into it, can 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 make uh, you know requests into it with a lot of speed, and so that kind of that competition we think will will hold people honest and and competitive um, from a cons- consumer perspective. Um, you know anybody can also hold Tau, so anybody can use Tau, anybody uh, can own it, so it's read write own. Um, mining just is just a little difficult, uh, and that's that's part of the 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 difficulties of the, um, you know, stemming from the fact that, that AI is actually quite expensive. Right. Um, and that's, that's also why we need an incentive mechanism. This commodity can't be shared without profit sharing. It's just too expensive. It really is quite expensive to run a GPU. Yeah. So you touched on the difficulty of, you know, registering right now, which uh, I had um, the joy of about a month ago and it was, it was quite easy and now it's it's picking up on difficulty so do yeah. you see like as time goes on the only institutional clients or people that have you know thousands to tens of thousands of dollars to to run these miners and validators are the ones that are you know validating on the network or do you see kind of like a, a distribution of of more like retail people being able to <laughs> like as uh, maybe subnets come i, I mean I, like like in bitcoin mining you know <clears throat> It's the way that we're going to bring more people in is with pooling, um, where people that don't have a lot of cash can can maybe, um, you know, pool that that cash together to create a server. There's 4,096 endpoints in BitTensor right now, um, and it's a pretty large network. Probably there's at least a trillion parameters on on the network, which makes us one of the largest language models in the world. And the you know incentive per day is something like ninety thousand dollars, right? Um, and the market is quite efficient. So people are spending maybe about $90,000 uh, across those 4,000 endpoints. So th- that's significant um, demand to get in the network, which drives the, the proof of work up. And that's why we see it so high. Uh, the only way to bring it down, we think, is to increase the number of UIDs, which is where we're going to go. Essentially having multiple networks um, in the BitTensor ecosystem um, so that we can work on different problems, more specific problems, different modalities, um, and probably we'll have in the 100,000 UIDs. Um, but if the project does reach you know, the, the billion dollar level, which I think it will, there will still be an incredible demand to get into that network. And and it will be not something that your grandma can can do in, in an afternoon to to get up and running and, and run something that is competitive with with the rest of the network. Uh, I think that's just kind of the limitations of being a miner in a hyper competitive system. Chase, I see you unmuted. Yeah, I, Jacob, thanks for that response. I was just going to like kind of follow up on this, and you know, for people like myself, I'm I'm not I'm not like super but super well versed in bit sensor, so I think uh, just kind of zooming back out. Starting at a high level, could you touch on the roles? Because I know you have, there's uh, a few different components. You have servers, uh, and then you have like validator nodes. Could you kind of touch on the, the roles that those play within the ecosystem? Sure. There's, there's, two, there's two main nodes. There's, there's people that are solely producing machine intelligence, and there's, there's, there's computers which are solely validating it. They can be the same computer, but in practice, uh, people separate those, those concerns. And that's why we have the two classes. So the third class is really just the union of the two, you know, a computer, which is, which is uh, soaking up knowledge and then also serving it. 
um, which which would make sense, right? Because you're you're if the network is holding value, then we should you should be able to extract knowledge from it and use it to to perform better in the network. Um, the but to break it down in in that way, the the miners are effectively language models that are trying to produce representations that the validators will find valuable. The validators are computers which are attempting to figure out who in the network is valuable um, according to a data set, which is universally accepted by the other validators. Um, and they're trying to quickly evaluate who is who is the most performant miner um, so that they can they can purchase, they can speculate on its value and, and purchase bonds in it uh, to maximize their their inflation in the system. So the, that's that's the way that we designed the consensus mechanism. It's it's really like, a you know, it's a it's a free for all for evaluating the the informational significance of the miners i know it's a race to speculate on that by the validators and then the miners are attempting to fill the holes um, created by the validators gotcha and so um i know all the the nodes that are assigned uh the task of like parsing collections of text like you just touched on but ultimately kind of where where's all that data being originated from like where, where's the source of that data is it the individual entities behind you know each node or, or mining, or what does that relationship kind of look like? It can be the individual uh, nodes and entities, but in practice, we provide a data set that's you know parsed and ready for them to use, um, and we source that from the web. Um, the ma the majority of the text comes from a data set called Pile, which was produced by an open source community called Eleuther. Um, we also append to that data set and host it on IPFS. the The internet is producing a gargantuan amount of textual data every day, something like a terabyte a day. And, and that gets dropped in, uh, with something called the, um, uh, the cr common crawl every month, a 30 terabyte file uh, with, with text from every source on the internet, archive articles, Twitter, Reddit, Google, any blog post. This just gets scraped into a very large text file. So we use that, that, that corpus and, you know, th this, I think, separates us from, if you call it like Web 2 machine learning, because in Web 2, people are, are trying to find these data sets, like Ocean Protocol, for instance, is built around the concept of, um, you know, at least part of that, that companies were built around the concept of monetizing um, information streams or data set streams. Um, and I spoke to the founders, and they w were thinking about the AI problem in terms of, you know, getting good data. But it turns out that, you know, in the modern AI world, the thing that has real value is not the data, but the the refined data that you, the information in, in the neural networks that has extracted the value from that that you know corpus and turned it into something um, useful for solving these machine learning problems. So the the data set itself simply exists to construct the incentive landscape that the miners are working working through. They can use that data set to fine tune their models, and we have you know. Um, uh, we have scripts for our miners to run, to fine tune, to perform better within the system. So it, cre it, it structures the, a, a normal machine learning problem as a market rather than just a benchmark. Yeah, that, that's super interesting. And, and there's a scoring mechanism involved. Could you kind of touch on that and how that plays into the consensus uh, algorithm? Yes, absolutely. So um, there's a type of machine learning model called an ensemble or a mixtures of experts model where you take a bunch of different machine learning models and you combine the, the models together to produce a machine learning model on top of that. Uh, you query a certain section of the network to get r responses, and then you take those responses and feed them through another part of a neural network to, to sift out the valuable information. We use that technology as like the core um, technology for picking which peers to speak to and for stitching together this neural network. The validators are the head of that that neural architecture, and the miners are the the foundation. So they select for each input who they're going to query, get those inputs, and learn who's valuable for solving their specific problem. In the process of learning, they can determine, oh, okay, well, uh, Chase's miner, for instance, is not producing anything of value. Uh, he can he's essentially noise. He can be removed from the the active set um, of peers that I'm going to set a, a high weight to. Uh, we take the, the sum total of those weights uh, to produce a, a global scoring for each miner um, and then distribute the, the emission to those miners, you know, dripping each block. One block every 12 seconds. One tau, sorry, one tau every 12 seconds, which is one block.
yeah, that's it's super interesting. And I think also it's just, you know, it's some learning behind it between AI and the merging of, of blockchain because you know, when you think of consensus, you're usually in, in terms of blockchain, you're thinking about consensus of like, you know, the state of the ledger. But this is the the state of quality of nodes within the, the ecosystem. Is that is that like a fair kind of yes, exactly. dummy down response or version? Which you said? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And the the validation is done by the the validator sorry the consensus is, is amongst the validators so they determine the validators collectively what the network is working on and reach consensus about what they're going to reward you know then the mechanism ensures that the the larger set of them is the one that drives the system um, and the the larger set of them is the is the one that that determines which of the peers are going to be making money and which of them are not the a little bit like the longest chain in in Bitcoin um, but it's a proof of stake system, so it's it's more about the 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 set of validators which have the largest amount of stake. Gotcha. I want to circle back to uh, a point you had touched on. You had started to touch on the crypto economics, but before doing so, you had mentioned earlier about there being a lot of different entities that will play a role and use their own models within this larger network. Yeah. What does IP protection look like for companies that may have, you know, very strong models and they want to keep uh, and protect that IP? Is that protected within this uh, ecosystem? Could you kind of touch on that? So we're inverting the problem of IP because uh, traditionally the the up tier is that the IP would be around the weights of the model, right? So we don't want to open source the the weights of GPT three because that has all of the you know the the monetization for that company. Uh, monetization, monetization present potential. We're flipping it and saying no. The the value is the information that you can get out of the model. So the value is the is the model that you can inference, um, and that's the thing that we want to share. So the models actually stay behind the scenes, and the weights don't get shared. It's just the ability to inference them that that is being open sourced. Because it doesn't matter really if you have a really large model if you can't inference it. And that's very expensive, right? To, to run an inference on a GPT-3 would require a number of GPUs um, and very it would be very expensive to do. Gotcha. Okay. Um, and by inference, when, whenever you say inference in terms of, you know, machine learning and, and modeling, what is that specific act? So inference is the actual querying of the model that's been trained. Training is the process of, of uh, annealing the weights or or adapting the weights to fit a loss function. And that's the process of taking the, the inputs in um, and then computing a gradient and applying the gradient to the weights until you've you know, adapted the weights to um, you know, a local minima where you're solving your problem well. Inference is just the value produced when you do that forward pass. So there's no concept of, of taking a gradient and passing it into the model and, and adapting the weights. It's the final product. Inference is the final product of the machine learning model. Training is the process that, that creates that final process, that, that final product. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for that breakdown. This is, this is a very informative uh, conversation around AI and I'm learning, I'm learning a lot. Uh, switching back to some things I do know a little bit about um, crypto economics, you had touched on uh, kind of like the emissions. I was just wondering if you could kind of expand on the emissions and how that plays a role. I think you mentioned um, every 12 seconds, you have a, a, a new block. Yeah. So we, we picked something really conservative. Um, with the emission, we just picked the the Bitcoin uh, emission curve because uh, we think that you know people understand it really well, and we're not that's not our innovation as a company. So we picked that, and and we have you know four year having cycles approximately, and you know twenty one million limitation on the tokens. The, every block releases a tau because our our blocks are uh, twelve seconds, so that's. Um, enough to match the the emission cycle of of Bitcoin for one tau per block, and we take that tau, we split it up amongst the validators, fifty fifty, and the miners. And we take the miners, we rank them, we we order them, and then we take the top and distribute the tokens proportional to their to their ranking in the system. <clears throat> so. Thank you for that that breakdown, by the way, Jake. And before I get into my next question, I just want to go ahead and ask you, for those that don't know, what is the purpose of the Tau token? So why why would somebody need to either hold Tau or um, 
maybe lend their Tau out through like a forward facing UI for other companies? Right. That's a really great question. And where we've seen this, the, the project go in the, in the you know, two years that we've been running it is that in order to build, start building an application, you need to hold Tau. Um, you know, we have an application running. It's, it's you know, the, the Alpha Playground right now running on Nakamoto, which is our main network. And in order to have the, the request bandwidth to make that application worthwhile, you have to hold a certain amount of talent. That one's holding a fair amount. That's where we see the utility come in for the token, right? You are given access to this, this whole library of machine learning models to build an application on top of. So it really is utility token in that, in that way. Um, you could build um, a DAL A2 or a DAL A3 um, hosted on the network, get paid for it. That somebody who wants to query that network to do image generation can use a front-end application that someone has built for them, or they can get in the network and, and do the queries themselves. That's how we imagine the, the structure will evolve um, because it, it requires a fair amount of tau to kind of have high fidelity. Um, and if that is the the future for the project, you know the the large holders of Tau can can start building AI companies and applications, monetizing their Tau by by validating with it and using it to to shift the network um, to adapt to their their needs. Uh, Playground is a really good example of of how, what we see that turning into. Very cool. So those who want to access the information that these AIs and uh, are generating will have to either own Tau or rent it through someone else's intelligence uh, through their yeah, code. Exactly. Yeah. So recently, you guys also congratulations on Synapse. So you guys have upgraded to uh, your network to the version three point zero point zero, which is called Synapse. Could you give kind of a brief overview of what Synapse is and how it helps scale BitTensor? Sure. Um... We started with this very pure definition of machine intelligence, which was tensor-based. So the responses from the servers were these 10, 10, 10 24 dimensional vectors, tensors. Uh, each of the tensors would represent a single token in a sentence. And that was like the, the highest bandwidth informational view on the, the input sentence. So you could use it to do something like classification or sentiment analysis. Very useful for training another machine learning model, for instance so much information that the bandwidth was actually a limitation rather than the speed of the computes. Um, but machine learning models can have different heads, have different actuators in the same way that like the human mind, you know, we have, we have arms, we have legs, we have eyes, we have, we have our tongue. Um, we have our, our language, we have our eye movements. All of those are you know, actuators on top of the general knowledge of our mind. And synapses is, uh, you know, basically a protocol on top of BitTensor, which allowed us to integrate numerous types of actuators. You know, we can, we can query the network and ask them to, to take the, the outputs um, and format them in a way that, that we want them to be formatted. So, you know, a very useful way to do that format formatting would be to, to just convert the embeddings directly into text so we can do things like generation. The, the, that's the underlying, t underlying technology for, the playground. We actually want to do generation. We don't want the the, the most high resolution informational um, uh, representation of the language. We simply want to tell us what you what you think would come next in a sentence, and that allows us to build the application on the playground. So Synapse has opened up this this uh, you know this completely new um, you know toolkit of uh, evaluating the artificial intelligence models on the network. Um, for querying them, for doing inference, uh, and also building the the, the you know uh, uh, something that has a uh, can have a lot more bandwidth you know and uh, many more requests per second. So we've reduced you know I think a hundred fold the the cost on the network chip uh, uh, by by using synapses. We've also opened up the ability of of using playground with synapses, and we can use the same technology to use uh, create different modalities to have models like Gato which are doing language understanding, image understanding, um, you know, audio understanding all at the same time. So all of that kind of sits underneath Synapses, which is this first expansion in the protocol uh, that we're really excited about. Yeah, I know that you and the team have been working super hard. And also, Carol, you know, feel free to jump in here if you'd like. Um, so I know with Synapse, it's gotten increasingly more difficult to register, you know, your hotkey. Um, are there specific new, like, hardware or server requirements for miners and validators moving forward? Um, or is that not yet to be seen? I think it's been seen yet already. Um, the 
as I was mentioning before, the uh, the ability to measure different components of machine learning model allows us to make the validation uh, more accurate uh, in some ways. For instance, we can actually get a raw parameter count estimation of the of the model that the person is serving. This allows us to do some adversarial resistance. If people are simply running the same model um, uh, all over the place, uh, we can get a better estimation of, of who's doing that from the validator side and, and underweight that in the validation mechanism. So we've already impl implemented a lot of little tweaks like that to make it so that running larger models is, is more beneficial in the network. So, so because of that, if you want to run a larger model, you've got to run some more expensive hardware. So you can't get away with $5 con table machines and you'll have, you're going to need to have GPUs, which is where we're driving the network. We really want to drive the network in that direction because uh, in order to compete with the, the, the scale of some of our competitors, we're going to need to have, you know, at least 4,000 GPUs, you know, running full time. And, and that is, you know, what we're beginning to see already um, from point, es point estimates, estimates of uh, our own miners and, and people that we know in the community. So yeah, in, in short, yeah, get a, get a GPU. <laughs> um, so we actually had someone from the community ask this next question uh, and then it'll kind of segue into to my next question. So, he was wondering, will subnets bring uh, the difficulty down again? And are there any plans to eventually move to another system other than proof of work for registration? We want to keep it proof of work because it means that somebody can become a miner without having to purchase Tau. Um, we also don't want to use email registration because then people have to dox themselves. And uh, the POW is a, is a good estimation of what the miner is bringing to the network. Now that we've moved it to GPU registration, that means that the person who's who's pulling this miner into the system, you know, has GPUs at their disposal, which will be better for the serving. It's a better um, proxy for what they're bringing into the network. So we, although it's difficult, you know, it, it's it it is part of the mining process to to select who can participate in this in this network. The and we don't see an easy solution to getting around POW without in introducing something like a pay to play um, or introducing something like, a, a, you know, a KYC. And we don't want to go either those directions. So we're using this POW uh, proxy for, you know, the compute that the person is bringing to the, to the network. Um, will subnetworks bring the compute down? Yes, absolutely. Because it's really a supply and demand problem. There's, there's a finite number of slots. There's a lot of people who want to get it, get in them. Um, and so that's the amount of compute that people are going to expend in trying to get in the network. Uh, and it will probably linearly go up for a long period of time. Increasing the number of slots will bring that down because we split the the demand across more supply. Uh, simply, if we if we are, con are we, if we're going to you know 10x the number of slots with subnetworks, we'll probably see a 10x reduction. Um, also, there'll be some set of subnetworks which are more desirable than others, um, and it will allow miners to, to kind of get into an, an you know the easy mode, level one, um, and, and familiarize us with the BitTensor ecosystem, um, you know, right away. And, and we can even do things like hierarchical networks where there's there's moving up, and we move away from the POW altogether because we're using the ranking validation. Um, that we've built to measure uh, miners' performance as the PUI, the proof of intelligence that gets them into the network. Awesome. Thank you for that breakdown. Rare, if you're listening, I hope that answered your question. Um, so, Jake, I know that Polkadot Pair Jane is you know, on, on the uh, the roadmap for this year, if not earlier this year. To explain how this will help investors and users, and also I know that you can only buy Tau right now on uh, the community-made exchange not affiliated with the Open Sensor Foundation um, or OTC in the Discord, or you would have to mine and validate. So, in short, where, will Tau be listed on more DEXs or just one DEX? It will be listed on a number, a number of DEXs. Um, the, as soon as we get into the Polkadot ecosystem, people can begin writing contracts uh, with Tau on different chains. And we really open it up to the, to the world at that point, and we lose a lot of control. Uh, but that's where this baby's going. And there will be liquidity on these these DEXs and potentially on centralized exchanges at a certain point. Really, we, we the, the cat's out of the bag um, once we get into the Polkadot ecosystem. Uh, we think that it will bring a lot of attention just from an advertising perspective, like the, getting a slot is a big deal. Um, the liquidity is, is one aspect to it. 
but the the reason we went this direction in the first place is because we get shared decentralization um, with the Polkadot ecosystem. So so it's harder to shut us down, and people can start to begin to have a lot more trust in the the validation process and the the hardness of the consensus because we have less control to change it. Right now, it's it's you know it's a baby. We're moving it along um, slowly uh, on, on purpose uh, with a lot of um, you know control. Uh, you know uh, the foundation has a lot of control over the network. But we want to, you know, open the door and, and let the project out so that the community has a lot more trust in in what we're doing and, and, and knows that the, the protocol won't change you know, arbitrarily. Um, so so that's that's why we're moving that direction with with decentralization to get liquidity uh, and end of year is, is the goal. That's our, our K, um, you know, our OKR for the for the whole year. Very cool. Um, so just kind of move towards more of the use cases of BitTensor. Oh. For you personally, and then Kara, for you to answer as well, what are some of the projects you would like to see be on top of them? We want to see a DALI 2 competitor, DALI 2, DALI 3 competitor. We want a codex re- written into BitTensor that I can use in Visual Studios. Um, applications that, you know, the layman is using, uh, you know, a network for the people, by the people, you know. So so we want those type of applications to be plugged into BitTensor and start to feel around the edges of what uh, you know, can be done um, because we have this great scale. We have so many models on the network. Uh, we're not just building a very narrow band machine intelligence system. We're building a whole community of machine learning models. We are really interested in seeing what people can can do um, creatively uh, by tapping into that diversity that you know other projects don't have. So, you know, I'll, and I'll and I'll pass the I'll pass the mic over to Carol because I know he has lots of ideas here. Yeah, no, so. I think that there is there's a plethora of of things that can be deployed right now um, inside of the BitTensor network with the Synapse updates. So because we can you, do inference now uh, through the BitTensor API, uh, which you know you can just go straight through the BitTensor Python API and, and set it up. Um, you could right now go and onto Hugging Face the Hugging Face model or m- model hub, find a codex copy or like a recreation of codex um, and build it into VS code and then monetize this on your own. So this is what, like, this is what's so great about the BitTensor network is because it's a marketplace, not only are, is the existing applications of AI possible to do, like speaking only about language models, uh, soon image models will be coming out. You know, there's a, there's a lot that we're, we're heading towards where you can do inference, but, uh, there is, there is just a, because it's a marketplace, um, so many, like, I'll give you a great example. When Steve Jobs, in and Apple did the iPhone in the App Store. I guarantee you that Steve Jobs had no conception of something like Uber or Instagram being built on top of the iPhone. But because they, but the 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 developers were able to leverage the technology that came along with the iPhone, that was the hand in the hands of everyday people. They we were able to create brand new technologies that the original creators of the tool were not able to, to, to imagine on their own. And so with the Synapse update, you can right now, uh, particularly just with like language models, but soon all different types of models, um, Gato, Dolly 2, these are things that are on the top of my mind, but um, you know, the, these things can be built today and monetized today. And so one of the, the best ways to build an application like this and ensure that not only you remain in the network, but you have high priority access to the other uh, validators and, and servers in the network is by holding Tau um, on that hotkey and using that hotkey either as a validator or a server to run inference for your application. This can all be done today. Very cool. Uh, yeah, it'll, it'll be really exciting to see what, you know, even three to five years to 10 years, what's built on top of Incensor. And that kind of leads into my next question, and then we can go to community questions and, and wrap it up. Um, starting with Jake, where do you see BitTensor in three to five years and why? I know it's hard to guess, you know, because both industries are kind of growing at a rapid pace. But where, where would you like BitTensor to be? I want us to be a focal point in the AI industry. People are talking about how we've reached scale and performance that they have not. And I think that's really going to happen if we take advantage of our killer app, which is the ability to build these efficient incentive mechanisms where anybody can get in this network um, and contribute knowledge. We want the largest neural network in the world. 
in the same way that Bitcoin has the largest supercomputer in the world, you know, when people talk about who's got the biggest system, they're going to talk about BitTensor and then they're going to look at what we do and, and how we're doing this way better than, than the traditional system. Um, I, I'd like to see a, a suite of technologies that are built on top of BitTensor that really showcase that it's possible to build something, you know, that is high quality. Uh, we can copy a lot of the applications that you know standard um, you know, app developers are building and just host them directly on BitTensor to show that the real value here is in that unsupervised knowledge. Um, the, there are a number of companies that are coming along right now and saying, hey, well, great, the value is in the application and we don't think that's right. We think the, the value is in the intelligence. And that's why we built a network around you know, sharing this commodity. Um, so that would be, those would be the two directions that I really want to see. So like expanding in, in, in dimensionality, expanding in the number of parameters, expanding in the number of queries per second that our miners are, are running. Um, and that's going to come down to a lot of the people in this call that I know hold Tau, mine Tau. Um, you know, it, it, are we doing a good job? You know, we're all part of this. That's the beauty of these decentralized systems where we're all owning um, what we what we create. You know, we, it's our job really to to turn this system into you know a high uh, high perform you know high performing machine intelligence network. And and, and I want us to situ situate ourselves as like um, the the neural internet where people are going to train their models, where people are going to host them, um, and and where people are are talking about us. Probably at that stage in in three years, we're still at you know Bitcoin and and, and in 2013 2014 so so people are still laughing um but the the people that are paying attention uh that are looking for for the the new thing in ai are already you know looking at our direction and i think there'll be a lot more of those those people uh in in three to five years yeah where, where do you see the tensor in three to five years also thank you jake thank you yeah uh so I see the, the one of the things I really want to see um, coming along, and, and I think that it's already starting to happen, but uh, seeing the tooling advance. Um, well, now, while it's, it's very possible it's, it's, uh, to, to do inference and, and all these things, um, what I'm really excited about seeing is the ease of use in the same way where, like in 2019, 2020, if you try to use Hugging Face, I mean, it was like pulling teeth. It was it was very hard to do. But now it's incredibly easy to, you know, get a model from the hub and fine tune that model to your specific tax. And I think that we are going to see that same sort of thing happening in BitTensor in the, over three years where it becomes the default method of not only uh, uh, fine tuning, but running inference for your AI applications. And also uh, in the same vein of tooling, um, I, I really see where because it becomes so much more easier to to run uh, your AI models through BitTensor, um, I can really see something that's happening where uh, a bunch of new people who uh, are, are just getting started um, inside of the the you know mining, getting introduced to AI and building their own AI models, right? Um, I think that the BitTensor network, um, particularly the marketplace, is going to become so efficient that we are going to see emergent properties coming out of the network, some things that we, we necessarily couldn't predict, but will absolutely blow us away. Um, and so these are things that I, I'm really excited about. I think that we will hit the criticals um, that we need in order, in terms of intelligence um, within the next three years, just because the, uh, as we've seen since the Synapse update, just the scale of, of uh, people trying to get into the network, the scale of compute that's being added, the scale of the models that are being added, um, I think that it's really starting to compound and compound. And I think, you know, over the next couple of years, we're going to really see some emergent <laughs> technologies coming out of the marketplace. Yeah, that's super exciting. And uh, that kind of just rung a bell. I wonder if that's why my uh, my dividends are getting absolutely murdered right now. Um, I guess it could. <laughs> yeah, we, it's so, it's you got so to bring your model up. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually I'm not mining. Okay. Oh, you're val you're validating. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. But maybe just hardware uh, upgrade. You got to yeah. You got to stay uh, updated as well. Um, but but a lot of people have seen that a lot of their miners have have fallen off, and it's because there's just more demand. There's more required of them now. And if you were running a five dollar contable machine or whatever, uh, that's just not sufficient. And it never it never should have been. But you know, we we wanted to start off you know with humble beginnings, and you know here we are. But this is an exponential process that we're going through. It is going to get harder and harder. And and the idea of running you know ten or fifteen or hundred miners on BitTensor is going to be absurd. Um, you know, in the next three to five years, uh, you know, enjoy it while, while it lasts, guys. Um, <laughs>
Yeah, <laughs> two friends that are running quite a bit of miners. So, and then some of are in this call. So, <laughs> you guys better enjoy it. But um, near the end of this, and Kara, we we open it up to the community for anyone that has any questions. Do you guys have time for a few uh, community? Questions? Of course. So, anyone that um has a question for either one uh of our guests, if you would like to come up and ask a question, we'll bring you on. I also have one that someone sent in um, through text. So Terrence asks, is there any customer interest? And I assume he means from, you know, uh, any corporate entities or any businesses that want to use the, the knowledge that BitCenter is creating. Honestly, we haven't, we haven't been going out to that, that community at all. And so the answer, the short answer is no. Um, but there, we think that the, the communities in the, in the crypto industry that are working with AI will be interested because there's a lot of overlap with their community and, and what we do. And, uh, and so we want to, we want to share what we're building with them. We, we kind of think that we're still in the people are laughing at us phase of, 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 you know, BitTensor and that's to be expected. Um, we, we want to be building this first applications to showcase what we're, what we have here. And that was the, the idea with the playground. You know, if if you, if you're not going to come and do it, well, we'll do it. We'll we'll build an application that's more, which is more efficient than yours. So, um... yeah, and and I totally think that there is like a little bit of a lag going on right now, um, where so we just got uh, we just pushed the synapse update, um, and this is like fully unlocked inference. Um, but the thing is, is that if you take something like OpenAI's Playground, um, where you interface with GPT three or with uh, Codex. These are only singular models. And so sometimes those models um, aren't the best use case for the actual user itself. And so uh, one of the unique asymmetrical advantages that the BitSensor network has is the ability to query many UEs and pick out what, what the best answer would be. And so I think that as uh, this technology, the fundamentals of it um, are, are just asymmetrically better than what OpenAI or any of uh, uh, any, any people, any commercial entities that are deploying AI at scale right now. Um, and so because of this, it will become like a zero sum game where if they continue investing in the current way they're doing, it's like they're going to lose, they're going to go to zero. And so it, there, uh, there will come a point when we hit the critical mass, when these emergent posts start, start uh, uh, th this phenomenon starts occurring, where they'll have essentially no choice to join, but join the BitSensor network merely because from the 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 bit uh, the business or the the technological standpoints, um, they will merely be outcompeted through the marketplace that is BitTensor. Yeah, that's very interesting. And Terrence, I hope that um you know answers your question as well. I don't see anyone else requesting, so I'm just going to ask one last question that uh, me and Fourth were both kind of wondering because we have a little Discord group going on, and we want you know we want to run a business on top of uh, our validators, maybe pull them together. So, what would Say we wanted to run a, uh, you know, a business like that, and kind of lend out our our intelligence that our validator validator is um, producing. Would we need more of like a, a team of machine learning uh, engineers, or you know, what would that process kind of look like? Probably, you need application developers, people like like Carol that have an eye for for what people want to do, um, and and then you would build that company on top of your validator. So yeah, that, that, that really comes down to having an idea, having an idea, right? You have to have come up with your trick and trick pony, and then build build uh, a company around that 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 idea. Because you're large holders of Tau, great. The problems that you need to solve is solved for you. Because if you were going to try to do a company like as I mentioned before, Hemingway or or Orwell, you'd need a lot of compute to do it. But great, you you have a network of computers willing to adapt to your specific problem. You have a network of computers that are willing to do. Uh, inference for you all the time 24/ um, and and you don't have you don't even really have to pay for it so so there you go there's there's the foundation of your AI company should you ever come up with an application idea and you know we hope that you you guys obviously use BitTensor. and if you go through this process you can you can teach us about what what we need to do to make that easier also very cool um, chase Mewtwo, do you guys have anything else to add before we wrap this up no, just uh, really appreciate both of you guys coming on. I learned a, a ton about BitTensor, and I think this is one of those episodes I'll be re-listening to. This <laughs> yeah, uh, I was the awesome. plus one to, to all that as well. Uh, thank you both for coming on. Really enjoyed the conversation tonight.
Absolutely. It was a pleasure. Yeah, absolute pleasure. Thank you so much, guys. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Jake, and thank you, Carol. Everybody stay based. Hey, stay based. Stay, stay based. based. Based space.